were able to use our counselor part-time for counseling and part-time for marine science education. Um, I too have attended the Masonboro um, field trips for fifth graders. Um, the Audubon Society comes out and does bird watches. The, um, the North Carolina Agricultural Extension at the Arboretum um, has wonderful field trips and they come to your school. And I've worked very closely with Heather Keelan there um, when, when she was at DC Burgo. Um, we made a community garden. Um, I worked with Noble to bring solar panel um, project to the school because we had a teacher that wanted to do it. So I'm all about partnerships and getting kids doing hands-on kind of stuff. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I would like to throw in just a couple more thoughts. Uh, one is that we, I actually live right down the road from the Bird of Prey Rescue. So using them, they have field trips there. They'll come out to the school. Uh, the turtle rescue, and, and when I was the principal at North Topsail, one of my teachers actually came to me and said, we need to do a nature trail. So we actually built a nature trail right at the school. We used some young people that were working on their Eagle Scout um, uh, badge, and they built it for us. So we were working with, with our young people to, to build things uh, with, uh, you know, for our students. So that was, and the students loved going out there uh, we actually use it even when we did uh, a race. So we had it as part of our race. So uh, there's just so many opportunities. We live in a great area right by the ocean, uh, right by a lot of wonderful uh, waterways. So just so many opportunities for us to be outside with our students. Thank you. Do you have a comment? Yes, I do. Mr. Um, student nutrition has always been a big, a big, uh, topic of uh, concern in schools. And um, now what's student nutrition have to do with edu uh, environmental education? Well, kids like projects that produce some tangible uh, product, say, um, you know, maybe growing, you know, growing flowers in a garden or something like that. However, lots of times kids don't know how to, how to produce a uh, garden to feed themselves. And there's a, there are programs like hydroponic gardens where kids can be involved um, with this project almost year long and actually provide them, uh, grow and provide themselves uh, healthy snacks that they can eat throughout the day rather than the junk food that they bring in, into school. So this would be a, a great opportunity um, for kids not only to uh, get involved and understand the environment, but learn how to produce their own, their own food. All right. I don't see Mr. McGee, so I don't know if he wants to make a comment or not. So we'll go on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> and this would be uh, to Mr. Mick first. Um, what plans do you have to address the mental health needs of New Hanover County students? New Hanover County, uh, suicide rates in New Hanover County are three times higher than our neighboring counties. So I would like to introduce uh, uh, policy suggestions to the board, because obviously one person can't do it all, um, that where we have more mental health workers in the schools to be able to take some of the load off the guidance counselors uh, to uh, uh, work with kids who have issues that, that may not be um, adequately addressed through guidance counselors. Um, I know we've had um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the health access for teens in, uh, um, in, in some of the schools, but they need to be in all the schools from elementary right up into, into high school. Because um, the numbers that I, I just quoted are, are from, for nine-year-olds up to 18-year-olds. Um, and that, that came from a report from WECT in, uh, in 2016. Um, so getting, getting uh, corp companies that only focus on mental health would be, would be I want to get them in to help us out. All right. Somebody if else jump, have a comment? If I could jump in, please. Who was that? Uh, Pete Wildeboer. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, at, at my school, uh, before I retired, we actually had outside agencies such as Coastal Horizon coming in. Uh, and working with our young people. A lot of the parents actually uh, struggled getting their children to some of the mental help uh, that they needed. So we were actually able to partner with them. Of course,
course, you know, you had to be all legal and, and, and parents had to yeah. sign, but uh, they were actually able to come into the school, meet with the students, be able to support the students uh, in school. So I think it is important that we definitely support our children, especially after this whole pandemic, when they go back to trying to, uh, you know, go back into a normal classroom uh, setting after month after month of being out of school. So I think it's a vital, vital time. And I think that the more we can reach out to, to partner agencies, the better off it will be. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, um, this is Tony McGee. I think um, what Pete just said is so important, having, having uh, others with this type of expertise, that if we notice something, and I think that's the idea of, of, of keeping our head or those in the classroom paying attention. So if something, um, something shows up in the student, that you know, of course, maintaining privacy and parental permission and all of that kind of thing of being able to say, hey, listen, we want to evaluate your child, and of course, that's a that's a that's kind of a dangerous thing because once something is discovered, it jumps off and, and goes in so many different directions. So I think having the the type of expertise that when counsel is required, it can come in, they can receive some counsel and some instructions, and at the same time, if there's some legal ramifications. That need to be dealt with, then you know we cross that bridge too. But making sure that all of the legal eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed. Anybody else on this question? I would like to chime in, please, Stephanie Walker. You ready? Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm I'm a very strong proponent of teaching resiliency to kids. Um, I'm a high ACEs child, so I know how important counselors were to me growing up. And I think if we can we can focus on you know moving towards more uh, trauma informed instruction, uh, maybe reducing suspensions in elementaries, especially because I know I, I've looked at the rates of suspension in some of these elementary schools, especially our high um, poverty schools, and there's a lot of trauma uh, that kids have to deal with. And I think you know uh, if we can change our focus with that, and and, and maybe instead of at an early age instead of suspending children. And look at them as if they, you know, they're not being bad kids. What can we do to help them? I think that will go a long way with things like depression and stuff like that. So, I mean, I encourage, you know, instead of spending money on SRO officers, perhaps maybe spend that money in elementary schools for counselors. Um, it would be a lot in social workers. It would be a lot better for the kids. And that's what I'm always thinking about what's best for them. All right. Thank you. I'd like to add one, well, a couple things. Excuse me. When it comes to mental health, proact or react. Obviously, we have records of the students that will be returning who have issues, and there will be more, which will be identified by counselors, of which we can never have enough, and also the mental health in, uh, agents in our schools. Obviously, accessing mental health agencies outside of our schools is important. But I, my question is, does the present board have a strategy? Because when you, when you react, you usually don't have a strategy. If you proact, you have a strategy. To deal with these kids, to identify, and then deal with these kids, as everyone has said, in that manner which works best for them. And if we don't have one, then we need to add that to one of the things we need to develop. Because after this school year, it's going to be a challenge in identifying what is mental health and what's just absolutely through the ceiling stress. But we've got to have a plan. It's not important. We have to have a plan, develop it, be proactive. Anybody else? I think Stephanie Crable is the only one that didn't have a comment. I do have a comment. I'd, I'd like to chime in. I, I'm going to talk really fast because I have a, a ton of ideas. Um, first and foremost, I think we need to talk with parents and have parents give their teachers just a little synopsis of what their kid is going through. You know, maybe they're going through some, you know, health issues or somebody has died or just stress is, issues at home. So if the teacher knows where the, where the students are, then they may be able to, you know, um, you know, help that in their teaching or their coaching off off site. We need to um, definitely keep working with the Department of Health to get more nurses and to make sure that our school, our student to nurse ratio is there. We need to work with the Department of Health and Social Services to make sure that mental health services and our, our counselor and I mean our social worker and our psychologist ratios are there. Um, we need to provide any way possible more caring adults in the building so that children have an opportunity to build relationships with people. Um, custodians, um, 
the teacher's assistants, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, um, regular volunteers in the school. Um, so that's it, sorry. And what clinics? All right, um, that takes care of that question pretty well. All right, um, Ms. Walker, you're next and first. Um, <clears throat> how do you see the role, your role as a board member to ensure that all students have equal access to a high quality education? Ooh, that's a, that's a really good broad question. Um, you know, I, I did my MPA capstone. It, it was on uh, the strength of PTAs versus test scores in the Andrew County Schools. And what I learned is there is a strong correlation between poverty and test scores. And that tells you a lot. It tells you that it's a bigger problem than just schools. But as a, but as a uh, school board member, you know, we're, we're the governance part, governance part of it. You know, we, we look a lot at, at policy and that's, that's really what I, I focus a lot on it with my background in public administration. And we want to make sure that, you know, you know, obviously the safety thing, the transparency thing, the way that the school board runs and is and works, it, it needs to be streamlined. It needs to work the way it's intended to work. We don't need back, you know, meetings in the background and things like that. We got to focus on children. That is, that is all I am interested in doing. And I know obviously all the rest of you guys are too, but, you know, as we know, um, it doesn't always work out that way. So, you know, I look a lot at suspension rates. I look a lot at kindergarten readiness gaps. I look a lot at, you know, the concentration of high poverty schools. You know, I focus on things uh, from from policy perspective mostly, but you know, thank you. I would keep going. Hi, somebody else have a comment on that one? You, unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am, I'm trying, thank you. Uh, I agree with what, what Stephanie said. If those of you that saw the uh, Port City Daily on the opportunity gap on September the 6th, uh, some statistics which don't have enough time to, to go through them, but 38% of the kids coming in in New Hanover County, as I, if I understood it correctly, um, uh, lack the skills, the skill set uh, for coming into kindergarten with I think the state average of our move was 50%. Uh, data says, and I'm a big believer in, in data, if it comes from the right resource, data says that a child without access to a computer or internet, their educational opportunities and their adult opportunities are severely minimized. The world is at the fingertips when you have internet and technology. There is nothing you cannot ask and get an answer, discover, see, listen. We need technology and internet. Right. If I, could, uh, yeah, if I could throw in just uh, two quick thoughts. One is, as she was just talking about, um, helping those students be prepared for kindergarten. Um, at my last school, we had three uh, pre-K classrooms, one EC, two regular pre-K uh, pre classrooms. So I think that pre-K is huge, very, very important. Um, but I also would like to say that I think that the, as a board member, um, I think I would challenge all the rest of the board members to go to those schools. And you know, I, it, it's, it's shameful that, that uh, a lot of the teachers have said they've never seen a board member walk through the classrooms. And um, we, these, these, especially these struggling schools, I mean, I think we need to be there, not to supersede the superintendent or the principal, but to see how we can help and be able to report back to the board. So we have that clear communication, you know, firsthand knowledge of what's going on, especially in our struggling schools. I think that's huge. Uh, and again, I, I'm going to be uh, in and out of schools to the point where they're going to expect me to be coming in. Uh, thank you. So I wanted to add, I wanted to add, add the point of a strategic plan. I think, I think when we talk about, well, the different things that are good ideas and things that should be done, if we don't have a strategic plan in place that includes those things, then when something comes up, we get pulled off of those, off of that plan, and we may not get back to it. I think uh, to speak to what I think Hugh talked about earlier, we'll find ourselves reacting instead of proacting. So, so starting out and saying, hey, this is the strategic plan. This is how we're gonna reach certain students with certain situations. And once we, once we develop that, that becomes a, a part of our mission, making sure that we're on task, with our strategic plan. And if we do that, even if we have emergency situations or things that were, were not expected, we still know to come back to that plan to make sure that we're providing a proper education for all students. 
Um, so I'd like to uh, wrap it up with um, comments that I agree wholeheartedly with everything that everybody said there. Um, it sounds like we would all six make great board members and work, you know, cohesively as a group. But what I would like to see happen is more um, transparent, open, commute, casual even, you know, communication. So that, and again, it goes back to caring adults in the building. If the, if the board members are just in the buildings, just meeting teachers, meeting students, meeting principals, I mean, like really meeting them and not just being in front of them, um, that would go a long way. I would like to see the school board have, you know, regular dialogue, like town hall kind of meetings for, for parents, and then a regular town hall kind of meeting with teachers, and a regular town hall kind of meeting with students, so that we get a chance to hear um, all, from all of our stakeholders. And then, it, and I would include parents and community kind of in, in one. Um, when I was PTA council president back in 2010, we had all of those things, and I really would like to bring them back. All right, Mr. Meek, anything to say? I'd like to say the visibility and accessibility that both uh, Stephanie and Pete mentioned are, are absolute paramount. A unified board is gonna be the single most important thing for all the planning, strategic priorities of what will come first. I'm listening to all of our answers on the dollars are rolling or how much you call <laughs> these things we wanna do. And we've gotta have a reality therapy session uh, of the new board to agree on the priorities. I gotta go back to that quick article in Port City Daily. The information there was unbelievable. The lead teacher, I don't wanna mispronounce her last name, it was Amanda Cossack, <laughs> since 2012. I think it's Chris's turn. I, yeah, I think it's Chris Meek's turn, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, I think Chris. <laughs> oh, I apologize. Think it, it's okay. I mean, it was good, I liked it, but I would just say Chris. <laughs> Do you wanna say anything? Actually, yeah, he was, he was leading right into my, into my point. <laughs> um, students who believe they can, they can su succeed will succeed. That's just, that's basic psychology. Um, when I taught at Williston Middle School, I was there for eight years, and uh, I saw kids in my class who were not your typical um, AIG kids, in, in other words, my minority kids, who were more than qualified, had the aptitude to, to, to work at or above the levels our AIG kids were, were. However, they were never given really the opportunity to. Um, you know, I was told once by, by a colleague, just give them busy work and keep them quiet. And I just like, as an educator, that just drove me nuts. Um, you know, but I, when you, when you go from like, if you start in elementary school and you um, build that confidence, you're going to see more kids in the advanced classes. You're going to see uh, in 2018, 5.6% of AP classes were black students. However, 75.28% were white students. Okay, that shows you at the high school level, you're, 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 you're checking out. out. Why? Because they don't have. All right, um, I think we're to a point where we can begin our closing statements. And so- I don't think Pete had his first question. Huh? I don't think Pete had his first question. Did you, Pete, have a No, he didn't. No, but he didn't. we're getting on towards eight o'clock and we're supposed to take an hour. Um, it, it just seems like you should have a first question. But well, I'll yes. give him one. I have one. Okay, well, okay. thank you. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. I, um, the procedure in New Hanover County for parents reporting misconduct by a teacher seems to need a revamp. Amen. How would you proceed to remedy that problem? Well, thank you so much. Uh, as I said, my, my, the pinnacle of my uh, campaign it has been student safety. And I would say 100% we do need a new program. My thought is that we would bring the outside agency, the SRO, and the school safety officer where a parent could just get on the phone, every parent would know it, um, they would contact the, this team, this team would come in and investigate, we would take the administrator out of the whole loop so the administrator would not have to investigate one of his or her teachers, uh, and this, this committee would be transparent so they would report back to the superintendent, back to the board, and back to the principal and then and in HR also. 
And if we needed two or three of these committees, then so be it. But I think it's very, very important that we don't keep it in internally. Uh, we use that, we have SROs. So whoever the uh, lead SRO is, they would work uh, hand in hand with that uh, school safety officer. This would be a number where you could just get, get and report uh, that person uh, and we could do a full investigation. I think it's critical that we do full investigations so we can get our, uh, you know, our, our whole school system back. Thank you, sorry, back on over. So I'd, I'd like to um, answer that question as well. Um, the school system is making progress towards that. Um, they, um, the, the Title IX committee was established last year and I am a member of that committee um, representing the New Hanover County Council of PTAs. Um, we do have three new policies in place, um, 7125, 7126, and I can't remember the third one, um, but the third one sp speaks specifically to students and teachers and parents on how to file a complaint. Um, there, it's a system called Ethics 360. They um, are in the process of making sure that all teachers and um, all adults in the building are trained on that. And then they will be rolling out a semblance of that reporting system to the students. Um, they've been doing training um, for all the, the teachers and counselors and staff on darkness into light. And they are almost complete with that. Um, we are getting ready to bring in training called Being the Bystander where um, it talks to students and teachers about what to do when they see these kinds of things happening. Um, and then there is also a elementary school program that's um, safe for kids. And all that's gonna be being rolled out you know, very shortly with um, high transparency and reporting on how that looks. Um, also too, um, we need to make sure that our SROs are not used as disciplinarians, that the SROs are there to, be, to handle a true emergency and they're also there to be caring adults in the building and try and you know, help students out. So we don't want the SROs ever to be seen as the cops in the school. They are, they are helpers in the school. Um, lots of programs coming out. So. Sorry, Stephanie, yeah. your time is up. Sorry. Uh, I'd like to add to that, please, Stephanie Walker. Um, I agree uh, very much so about SROs in the elementary school. They, they should never be used for disciplining children. That is not what they were there, there for. I know there may be um, times when they are needed um, in maybe even the upper level schools. And of course, there are things that do happen that, that need them. But uh, you know, using SRO officers as part of the disciplinary realm is just not what they're for. And I just think it sends the wrong message to students, um, especially in the lower grades. You know, we don't, we got to address the, um, the school to prison pipeline issues. And that does include, you know, SRO officers and, um, you know, maybe moving, moving away from that in elementary. Um, I'd like to look at the data too, first before I really kind of delve into it. But uh, when it comes to safety, uh, we also have to create a culture up at the top, especially that, um, that addresses these issues and not just has, whether we have Ethics 360 or whatever, we really need to be leaders. And that includes really looking at uh, not allowing these things to exist in the system to begin with. So thank you. <laughs> Anybody else on that question? Seeing no one. I'll take it. I do. Okay. Yeah. I um, take it. Over the last 20 years, our, our county has not had a very good record on, on protecting children um, from predators. Um, so while I've heard a lot of, a lot of good ideas, um, the process broke down on multiple levels, not just in the schools, but agencies outside of the schools. Um, so I would like to, to, to do a, some, create some kind of a pilot program with the uh, Attorney General's office. And maybe if it worked here, it can work in other, other parts of the state, maybe uh, you know, the country, where there is a reporting system that goes right to the Attorney General and then the investigation can start at the attorney general and then come on down. Just like in, in special education, you have the Office of Civil Rights um, uh, uh, violations that are, that are handled at the uh, federal and the state level. Well, we could do the same thing with this. And, um, you know, our kids have not been protected. When a teacher has been, been uh, covered up for uh, from 2003 to 2017 or, or 16, okay, there's a problem there. And that kid started from the top on down. Okay, so we have to have some kind of a, uh, a, a program outside of the district. 
Well, I'm gonna, I, want to just add, I just want to add a little thing there. It, it seems to me that if we, if we embrace some concepts of just culture, in other words, that if, if something pops up, uh, you don't just allow one person to say, we're not gonna deal with it. Something pops up, that should be automatic. The entire system should go to bat and say, let's get to the bottom of this. I understand saying, hey, let's not um, pit the teacher against the administration. I get all of that. But it seems to me that if there is a question, if there's a whisper of any child being taken advantage of, the entire system should turn to in a just culture, culture environment that nobody's going to be punished for, for, for standing up. Or there's no, you know, you shouldn't have said anything kind of thing and handle that immediately. I mean, we're talking about a lot of things we're talking about doing, but it's just a simple cultural change in my, in, in my way of looking at it. All right, you got anything to say on that? You're the only one that's not spoken. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I'm going to be real simple about, I guess, something about this. Uh, the principal is responsible for his or her school. If he or she has information, who is the individual that they contact immediately? Because then that individual owns it. Their responsibility should be outlined. The superintendent always called the superintendent whether it did not come to fruition or, but I always said, I've got a problem. And I dealt with several problems that the board has had. Went straight to the superintendent. That way we all know who received the information, who's responsible. I think you get too many people in the mix, nothing against all the avenues for reporting, but you get too many people in the mix for responsibility. That's where it can be said that it was lost. One person identified to handle those types of situations, they own it, and then we all know who's responsible. All right, Thank now you. it's time for our closing statements and we'll, we'll start with you, Mr. Wildebar. Unmute first. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Pete Wildebar and I would love to have your vote uh, in November. Uh, I am a 34 year veteran teacher, coach, athletic director, principal, and assistant principal. My wife is also a uh, longtime educator in New Hanover County. What am I standing for? Student health, getting our students safely back into school as soon as possible. Very, very important. Uh, my team has looked at the idea of uh, germicidal ultraviolet. The hospitals use it. Let's use it to get our kids back safely in school. Student safety, we've talked a lot about that. I have just a few seconds here, so, uh, but we need to keep our students safe from the inside and from the outside. School improvement, every student every day needs to learn. Every student can learn, we need to make sure they do. And my last point is tech, uh, technological uh, advancement, uh, access to technology for all students every day. Thank you very much, vote for Pete Wildeboer. All right, Stephanie Walker. Thank you, thanks for doing the W's first. Anyway, um, I, first of all, I want to say I think school should be open when it's safe for students and, and teachers, period. So that's how I feel on that. But uh, otherwise, the catalyst for me, um, as I mentioned, I grew up here. Uh, my schools were College Park, Snipes, Tileson, Willison, and Hanover. Uh, so I, I, I grew up, um, you know, in this town, and I love it. And I just want the schools to be improved. I feel like there's a lot of trust that needs to be rebuilt. Um, you know, the catalyst for me also was doing my, my MPA capstone study. Uh, and really uncovering the um, disparities in the schools. And I just think it, it made me angry. <laughs> so that's really why I'm here. But I really think that we can address the inequity issues in our schools. Um, as a student that grew up here in an integrated system, it really upsets me to see that that has been undone. And that has been undone over the last couple of decades, especially a policy that in 2010, that um, basically hyper segregated our kids, not just by race, but socioeconomics as well. So I really think that we can do something about that. And they, the kids have just been, just left and I, that's upsetting to me. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, Mr. Meek. Wait a minute. Unmute your, yeah. Okay, am I, am I good now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Chris Meek, electrochrismeek.com. Um, my, my main issues are to make sure that the social and emotional um, and mental welfare of our students are, are is being met, uh, especially in these in these current times. Okay, 
that we have equity in our classrooms, both on the academic side and the discipline side, okay? And having excellent educators uh, in, our, in, in those classrooms. And the educators need to look like the students that they're teaching. Uh, that's something that we didn't address tonight. Um, having drawn in more uh, African-American and Latinx uh, uh, educators into, into our classrooms. I'm in the classroom for 26 years. I'm a dissertation away from a PhD in leadership and education administration. I've held many leadership positions from the school level to the NCAE state level. Um, and I've been in a deliberative body and I know how, how to work with people to get them done. Mr. McManus. Thank you. I have a little over 40, 40 years of uh, educational experience of which all were in administration, but three of, of teaching. I was very fortunate to be fast tracked into administration. My wife retired from College Park Elementary as a teacher assistant. Um, we have had a tremendous amount of positive things that we all will agree at some point to support. I think that the new board, as I said in the opening, must be unified. We must agree with our priorities with the new superintendent. I've been the principal of the year at New Hanover County. I've been principal of the year in Pender County. I was recognized at Harvard as a National Assembly Blue Ribbon High School. I'm a UNCW Razor Walker uh, recipient, and I'm in my 14th year on Salvation Army Board, advisory board. Um, experience. This board needs experience. I truly believe that. There's so many qualified people running. I just feel that my experience in the educational leadership arena can afford opportunities when we're trying to make hard decisions and priorities. Uh, please check out my website, McManus for School Board. Again, thank you tonight for all of you that made this possible. And stay safe. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Crable. Uh, Tony. You're going backwards, right? Oh yeah, Tony. Excuse me. I checked okay. him off, and you hadn't talked yet. Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> okay. Well, again, you know, I'm Tony McGee. Again, thank you for this opportunity, and I want to ask those that are listening to to vote for me. You can go to TonyMcGee.com. Check that out. Um, Carter G. Woodson. If I could paraphrase something Carter G. Woodson said, and uh, he basically said there are two kind of educations a person needs. The first one is the one that somebody else gives him. The second one is the one he gives himself. And so from my perspective, that if we, if we, avoid, if we avoid the critical thinking piece, the person doesn't have the kind of education that they can move away from the classroom and actually succeed. So we gotta be mindful that our children know how to think, not just memorization. Memorization is an important part of learning, but how to think. What, and, and, if, and if we do that, I think, uh, we'll, do the, we'll do a great service in the education system here in New Hanover County. And I'm convinced it'll become a model for others to copy. All right, Ms. Crable. Okay, so I want you to know about me is that I'm a team builder, I'm a collaborator, I'm a communicator, and I'm an innovative outside the box thinker. I have been a substitute teacher and an active PTA member for over 20 years in New Hanover County Schools. I was a part of the strategic planning team in 2006 that wrote the plan um, for the four years of 2006 to 2010. The, um, I do not want to be a micromanager um, as a school board member, but I am not afraid to ask the tough questions and to get issues resolved, issues raised to the, to the, the forefront and get those issues resolved. Um, and get us back on track. The, um, I believe that we need to be, come to our school mission to provide high quality education with high quality teachers um, in a high quality, clean, safe working environment. Um, and I wanna leave you with this quote from John Quincy Adams, our sixth president. If your actions inspire you to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. And I want to be that leader for New Hanover County Schools. Please vote for Stephanie Craybill on or before um, November the 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Lower Cape Fear, the YWCA of the Lower Cape Fear, and the Coastal Review Online, a publishing arm of the NC Coastal Federation, I would like to thank the candidates for their participation tonight. 
Our forums will be posted on our website for further viewing. Be sure to plan your vote. You can check out the League of Women Voters Lower Cape Fear website to find the early voting site information and times in New Hanover County. And you can check out voter, I mean vote411.org for more candidate information. If you requested a mail-in ballot, we recommend you send it in as soon as possible. The earlier, the better. Tune in on Zoom at seven tomorrow night for we will have the county commissioner candidates. Thank you for participating and good night.